So, it feels like autumn is distinctly in the air uh, and people have been asking when story time is coming back because now is the perfect time to curl up with a book. Um, so, story time is back. And the great news is we have some lo more lovely George Layton stories for you from his second book called The Swap. The first story is called The Treehouse. The first time I ever saw Mr Bleasdale take the register, I couldn't take my eyes off him. That was because he didn't take his eye off me. Yes, his eye, his left eye. It was my first day at grammar school and I'd never seen anything like it. I'd been put in 1B and Mr Bleasdale was our form master. He also taught Latin and he could look down with one eye to read, write or take the register and at the same time he could keep his other eye on the class. It never blinked. It just stared at us, making sure nobody misbehaved whilst he was calling out our names. Barraclough? Yes sir. Bucock? Yes, sir. Caratha? Sir? Everyone answered when they heard their name called out. Nobody dared to look round to see what the lad shouting out looked like. We were all nervous anyway, it being our first day at the grammar, but none of us had seen anything like this. We just sat, staring straight ahead at Mr Bleasdale's eye. Edwards? Yes, sir. Emmett? Sir? Gower? Sir? How did he do it? How could anyone look down with one eye and stare straight ahead with the other? It was impossible. I tried it. I looked down at my desk and with my right eye, just like Mr Bleasdale, and tried to keep my left eye up. It was impossible. But it wasn't. Mr Bleasdale could do it. Perhaps all grammar school teachers could do it. Oh dear. Holdsworth? Yes, sir. Hopkinson? Yes, sir. Hopwood? Sir? Oh dear, at Highmore Primary we used to get away with murder when the teacher wasn't looking, especially in Miss Dixon's classes. Here we wouldn't be able to do anything except work. Certainly with Mr Bleasdale, because he'd always be looking. Lightowler? Yes sir! Even not but Lightowler was behaving himself, and he was dressed smartly for once. Well, for him. He hadn't got a brand new blazer like everyone else, his mum couldn't afford it, but she'd managed to get hold of a second hand one from somewhere. It was miles too big for him, but Norbert didn't seem to mind. Norbert was the only other lad I knew in 1B. We'd been at High Moor together, and everyone was surprised when he got into grammar school, especially Norbert. His mum wasn't very pleased because it meant him staying on at school till he was 16. She'd have rather had him leave soon as possible to get a job and bring in some money like the rest of his brothers and sisters. That's what my mum said anyway. At primary school, I'd always found Norbert a bit of a nuisance, always telling me I was his best friend, forever hanging round, trying to get in our gang. But today, I was glad he was sitting next to me. At least I knew somebody, and had somebody to talk to. Tony, my best friend, had come to the grammar as well, but he'd been put in one alpha. I couldn't wait to ask him if his teacher could watch the class with one eye while he looked down with the other. McDougall, sir? Mud, sir? Fancy having a name like that, Mud. Everyone giggled and a few, including me and Norbert, looked round to see what, what he looked like. He was a big lad, probably the biggest in the class. I wouldn't be laughing at his name again. Thank you, gentlemen. You've got this next five years to get to know each other, so I'd be grateful if we could have your undivided attention for the next few minutes. I turned back to the front as Mr Bleasdale carried on calling out our names, his right eye on the register, his left eye on us. None! Yes, sir. That was the first time I'd seen Mr Bleasdale. It was the last time our class would be so well behaved for him. By the end of the next of the morning break on that first day, I found out the truth. Or at least Norbert had. I was in the playground telling Tony about Mr Bleasdale's trick when Norbert came up to me. He'd already torn one of his blazer pockets. Hey, you'll never guess what I've just found out. Sure up a minute, will you? I'm just telling Tony about Mr Bleasdale. On his Tony, he can look down and write with his one eye and watch the class with the other, both at the same time. I could tell Tony didn't believe me, the way he was looking. Honestly, it's true. It's a fantastic trick, isn't it, Norbert? Norbert wiped with his, no his nose with his sleeve and nodded. Yeah, it'd be even better if you could see out of the eye he's watching with. I looked at Norbert, 
he wiped his nose again, with his other sleeve this time. You what? It's a glass eye. It's not real. It's just made of glass. I sat at my desk, staring at the glass eye. I still found it hard to believe that he couldn't see me, even now, nine months later. It looked so real, except it never blinked. Norbert had no doubts. He was mucking about as usual and Bleasdale looked up just in time to see him flicking a paper pellet at David Holdsworth. I saw that light, Ella. I'm not blind, you know. Get on with your revision. You've got exams in three days. Yes, sir. Norbert shoved his head into his Latin textbook and sniggered at the lads around him. When Bleasdale looked down, with his one eye, Norbert made a funny face at him, putting his fingers into his ears and waggling them around and then sticking his tongue out. He's not bothered about schoolwork and exams, Norbert. I had to do well, or I'd be in big trouble with my mum. If I didn't do well, very well, not only would I be in big trouble, but I wouldn't be allowed to go on the school trip to London to see the Festival of Britain. Mr Bleasdale and Mr Melrose were organising it. It was a day trip and it was going to cost £15. I was dead lucky to have my name down because when I'd asked my mum if I could go, she said no. In fact, she'd said no, no, no. No, no, no. Where do you think I'm going to find £15 from? You must be living in cloud cuckoo land, young man. We can pay in instalments, Mr Bleasdale says so. She gave me one of her looks. Oh, does he? Well, you can tell Mr Bleasdale that I'm still paying for your school uniform and instalments, your satchel and your bike. And that's when she saw the tear in my blazer. Just come here a minute. Oh, no. It was that Norbert, stupid Norbert's fault when he got, when he'd been trying to get ahead of me in the dinner queue, he got my pocket and swung me round. And that's how it ripped. Stupid idiot. Look at your new blazer. What on earth have you been up to? I don't know why she keeps calling me my new blazer. I got it last September. That's a brand new blazer. Look at your pocket. Take it off. I tried to tell her it was Norbert's fault, but she wouldn't listen. She just yanked the blazer off my black back and got a sewing machine out. She's paying for that in instalments too. You're lucky it's torn on the seam. I didn't say anything else about the school trip to London. I didn't dare. And don't you dare talk to me about school trips to London. I didn't have to. I was dead lucky. I got given the money, all £15 in fact. I had £15 in my post office saving book. £16, four and fourpence to be exact. I put one pound four and fourpence in last Saturday, one pound for my Auntie Dorian for clearing out her garden shed, and four and fourpence for the empty Guinness and Lucasair bottles I'd found there, and I'd taken them off to the corner shop on my way to youth club. My mum had told me off for taking the pound. It's far too much. Your Auntie Dorian can't afford that kind of money. How long did it take you to clean out the shed? Nearly an hour. I was late for youth club. It hadn't really taken me that long. I was there for the best part of an hour, but I spent a lot of time looking at those old magazines. They were called National Geo something, and they were ever so interesting. Pictures of natives with darts through their lips, that sort of thing. I'd ask my auntie Doreen if I could have them, but they wouldn't let. Me, but she wouldn't let me. No, they belong to your uncle Norm, and he wouldn't be right to give them away. Put them back in the shed. So back they'd gone under the old deck chairs, watering cans, paint pots, and fishing tackle. Ooh, I'd love to have a go with that fishing tackle. I'd ask my Auntie Doreen, even though I know what she'd say. No, it wouldn't be right. It were your Uncle Norman's. I don't know how long ago my Uncle Norman had died. I mean, I'd never known him, but it seemed daft to me to shove all these good things at the back of the shed. Nearly an hour? A pound for less than an hour? That's more than I get from Mrs Jerome. My mum goes cleaning for Mrs Jerome three mornings a week. It's a great big house on the other side of the park where the rich people live. They've got a tree house in their garden and Mrs Jerome lets me play in it sometimes. She's ever so nice. It's thanks to her that I'm going on the school trip because she gave me the money. I've been playing there in the tree house one Saturday morning while my mum was cleaning and Mrs Jerome had brought out some orange squash and some chocolate biscuits for me. Not just one side, chocolate on both sides. They were lovely. I think Mrs Jerome likes me coming to play in the treehouse because all her children are grown up. Except one. He got killed in the war. Anyway, she'd started asking me how I was enjoying grammar school and I'd said oh, I was alright. 
And what did I want to be when I grew up? And I said I didn't know. And who was my favourite film star? And so on. And then she'd asked me what was happening in school holidays and where I was going. And I told her we'd probably be doing the same as usual, going on the odd trip to Morecambe and Scarborough with my mum and Auntie Doreen. And she said she and Mr Jerome would be doing the same as usual, a cruise to the Canary Islands. And she said I could play in the treehouse while she was away. Actually, I'm ever so excited because Mr Jerome has arranged for us to stop off in London and have a few days to visit the Festival of Britain. And I had told her about the school trip to London and the Festival of Britain too and how it cost £15 and how I couldn't go because my mum couldn't afford it. Well, the following Tuesday I'd come home from school and my mum was sitting at the kitchen table holding a small book. She looked as though she'd been crying. What's the matter, mum? Are you all right? She hadn't said anything, she'd just given me the little book. It was a post office savings book. I'd opened it and had written my name inside and there was £15 in the account. I looked at my mum and I couldn't tell if she was pleased or cross. You're not going to London if you do badly in your exams and if you don't do well, very well, that money's going straight back to Mrs Jerome. I stared at my Latin textbook. Amo, amas, amat. It were all Greek to me. The bell went up for home time and everyone started packing up. Bleasdale was tapping on his desk to get our attention. Norbert was practically out of the door. One minute, gentlemen, and that includes you, Light Owler. Homework! Everyone groaned. I had tons already. French revision, an English essay, maths. I'm not setting any homework tonight. Everybody cheered. But I want you to do some extensive revision. Everybody groaned again. I shall be giving you a written vocabulary test tomorrow. More groans. It will be your last test before the exams. Now go home, you are of a lot, and do some work. We piled out into the corridor, and the headmaster hit Norbert on the side of his head and told him to stop running. He and a few others were off to play cricket in the schoolyard. Who's coming? It's Yorkshire against Lancashire. I'm Freddie Truman. When I batted, I'll be Willie Wil Watson. I didn't want to play cricket. I wanted to get on with revision. I wanted to go to London. Anyway, I never got a chance to bat. By the time it came to my turn, we usually got kicked out by the caretaker. I don't know why I went to play in the treehouse. It's not even on my way home, but I started walking with David Holdsworth and he goes that way through the park. Maybe I wanted to show off to him. I don't know, but it's what I did. I pointed to it as I went up the hill past Mrs Jerome's. You see that treehouse up there? I'm allowed to play in it. He looked at it. It was about 15 feet up in a big sycamore tree. I bet you wish you were. I am. Honest. I couldn't stop myself from smiling. Because I was smiling, he thought I was lying. I soon showed him I wasn't. I led the way up the ladder. After we'd been playing for about a quarter of an hour, I decided it was time to go. I've got to go soon, I've got to get on with my revision. David was pretending to be a commando in Korea. Pow pow! Oh don't you go yet, it's great up here. Pow pow! I wish we had gone. We wouldn't have been there when Norbert came past. It was David who saw him first, running up the hill. Look, there's Norbert. He must have got kicked out by the caretaker. Pow pow! You're dead Norbert! He looked round to see where the voice had come from. What are you doing up there? I'm coming up. I tried to stop him. I wanted to go home. Besides, even though I was allowed to play in the treehouse, I didn't think Mrs Jerome would like it if half the school turned up. It was a good job she was away. No, no, but we're going now. But he was halfway up the ladder. Oh, ain't it great? Don't tell any of the other lads. We'll keep it for ourselves. Keep it for ourselves. I had some cheek dig Norbert. I'm the only one allowed to play here. I know the owner. Now come on and get down. He didn't get down. He came in. You'll never guess what I found. He started rummaging under his jumper. These were in a dustbin. We used it as a wicket. Look! He held out some sheets of paper with purple writing on it. I couldn't tell what they said because the writing was backwards. It's rubbish this. All the writing's backwards. It's not rubbish. There are exam papers. These are the stencils that Mrs Smiley runs the copies off. Mrs Smiley's the school secretary. 
These are the questions we'll be getting. Look, 1B, summer term. Holdsworth grabbed one of the papers. We looked at it. Norbert was right. It was 1B, summer term, spelt backwards. Yeah, look, this is geography spelt backwards. He knelt down and started going through the questions, working out what they were. Norbert knelt down opposite him. They're all here, English, Latin, French, religious instruction. They started reading the questions aloud. I didn't want to hear them. I didn't want to cheat. I wanted to do well in my exams. I wanted to go to the Festival of Britain, but I didn't want to cheat. Stop! You mustn't! It's not right! I tried to get the papers before either of them could read any more. I was going to tear them up and throw them away, but no, but stop me. I don't think he meant to push me that hard, and 15 feet doesn't sound very high, but it is when you're falling out of a treehouse. I didn't do much that summer. There's not much you can do when you've broken both your legs. I didn't do the exams either, and I could because I couldn't do that with my right arm in plaster. My mum made me go to school though. She said there was no reason why I couldn't sit and read while the others did their exams. But I didn't do much reading. I spent most of the time staring at Mr Bleasdale's glass eye, thinking about the school trip I wouldn't be going on. My mum used the £15 to mend the treehouse. Well, I hope you enjoyed the story. Lots of people going back to school this week as well, so uh, got a hint of that beginning of term feeling about it. We'll see you all for another story very soon.